Hello everyone and welcome back to Tomorrow's and Beyond in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul. It's been a while since I posted a video in this series and that was because I was making a few things and making some decisions. First of all, changing the textures on the Orion carrier plane and testing the wings. I posted some videos on that. So we've had to do some figuring and problem solving for that, but now we have those. It was overshooting Cape Canaveral, but I think that uh, we can work on that separately. I'm not going to belabor that in this series. Uh, but in this case, we are actually going to partly solve that problem. Not that we're following the carry plane down this time, but uh, we are going to partly solve the problem by just overburdening it. Basically, it's not going to get as fast as it normally does. So it's not going to actually overshoot Cape Canaveral in this case. I think it'll be all right uh, if we were to follow it. But other than that, uh, I have had a lot of aggravation with Kerbalism, and so I've decided to get rid of it and restore Tack Life Support, checking that Tack Life Support is consuming things at the correct rate. Um, partly, it's because the dialogue for Kerbalism just wasn't showing me the information I need to plan some things out. Uh, another thing was that we obviously had problems with Kerbalism in relation to KSP Interstellar as far as power consumption goes. And KSP Interstellar is more fundamental to what I'm doing in the series. We really, really need it in order to make things work. And the whole using ion engines in time warp doesn't work very well if we've got the Kerbalism interfering with it. So I really need that to work out for us if we're going to be limited to the Orion carrier plane. So that is the decision. I mean, uh, at least I won't be complaining about what Kerbalism is doing anymore, let's put it that way. So, uh, really I wanted Kerbalism in because of the radiation simulation and I, I didn't really need the rest of its functionality and I don't know how well it would do the radiation simulation on a trip to Mars. We didn't get to the part where we could test that properly. It was looking alright so far, but I wasn't sure. So, yeah, we'll just have to use Kerbalism some other time. So, now, uh, and the, some of the other things that I needed to work on is uh, we are using the pass-through system in this series. Uh, there is a system whereby Kerbals have seats inside. There is no IVA view per se, right? They get into seats and then they float around in EVA mode. And one of the things I wanted to do was to physically move supplies from a supply vessel into our habitat or whatever. And so we have water tanks, we have care packages full of food, and we also have oxygen tanks. And so my goal with this particular video is to see if we can use the Taurus space plane to move the supplies in efficiently, and then have the Taurus space plane come back, keeping in mind that our habitat right now is in a high orbit above the Earth, and so it's hard to reach. So I don't know if... Uh, the Kerbals that we're sending in this are actually going to survive re-entry or even get to their destination properly. We've underfueled this because the Taurus itself isn't very efficient and we really need to get every ounce of efficiency as we can. So we are using Hydrolox. It's a big Hydrolox age makeshift. And we are we're going all out in the cheats here. We're using balloon cryo tanks. So yeah, am I proud of this? No, but it seems like it might be necessary, and even so, I don't know if it's going to get us to where we need to go. Uh, it is a very heavy sort of thing, the Taurus. The, the body is just this portion. There's also the front end and the wings and all that business. So, and then the supplies. So, I don't know. We'll see. I wanted to make the supplies as separate containers because the procedural tank containers, I don't know if they're properly sizing and massing things exactly. I think they're assuming that we don't already have a pressurized container. Uh, in other words, they're, it, they aren't in a cargo hold, and so they're pretend uh, those are massed as if they need to be a cargo hold instead of already being in one. So anyway, the little care packages, water tanks, and oxygen tanks that I have there are correctly sized and massed. Um, I look stuff up and so we'll see how it goes and of course the Kerbals in EVA mode I made sure that they could carry those so the EVA capabilities of the Kerbals have been modified somewhat uh, yep and this is just gonna be a little bit of an experiment let's see how it goes we've got some MLI layers not all the MLI layers 
And this whole business is pretty heavy. I don't know if MechJib is going to show the right numbers. I think it thinks it's 150 tons. So that's but it's not got the staging right at all. So yeah. Anyway, it is rather heavy and we'll see how it goes. I think oh, we don't have to do the launch access thing. We we had the arm before, but the reason for the arm was because Kerbalism wasn't going to play nice with them being in the seats at the start, but TAC Life Support doesn't have that problem. So we are just going to have them in the seats at the start. And let's see if we kill Jib and Bill. <laughs> it, it's got to be it's got to be tough. This is uh, no joke. If we were to use the crew access arm, though, it's not going to be able to reach up there. Maybe I need a separate crew access level thing. Yeah, uh, if we ever decide to do that, this is not the right setup. Okay, unless we have like a ladder going all the way up the the Taurus, that could work, I guess. Alright, so just the two of them, and we'll see if they can do the job. Aside from the food, water, and oxygen, of course, we are also going to have to deliver some more propellant. Okay, so there it is. And it will be departing in 59 days, so we need to do everything we want to do with it. We're very close to in line with it right now. This is actually pretty good timing, I think. Especially since we have to go on a heading of 75 degrees to get the carrier plane on its trajectory to Cape Canaveral. Aim camera there. Okay. Well, there could be complications. The Taurus space plane is different from our normal vessels, but let me time warp a little bit. Okay, maybe that's better. All right, SAS on, throttle up, ignition, and launch. And off we go. And we have the roll program. And it continues. Now I'm gonna have to pay attention to this. We want to make sure to reserve the fuel properly. And I can't use the 4,000 meter per second mark as uh, indication of anything. I think someone asked me about mods in this series, and I cannot emphasize enough the fact that I'm really making mods along the way. So uh, it's a little bit complicated. Eventually, I'll release stuff. I, I want to release a coherent sort of pass through mod pack that represents. The best principles of elegant design. I mean, our goal here really is in the series to sort of minimize exactly what we need. We're not going for the most uh, extravagant kind of method to do all this. We want the trimmest, the most efficient kind of way to do things. And that's what I'm aiming for and making the parts and trying to justify the parts along the way too, telling you the stats and everything so that. I eventually get sort of a neat little system and then I can share that with you as sort of the the EDB solution to things, the Ray's Aerospace solution to things. Uh, these are Schusserd engines, they're just really efficient Hydrolox engines. Basically big RL10s. Well, we can stop it right there. I mean, that's basically what I would want anyway. Okay, switching. Okay, RCS. It is good. All right. Um, yeah, let's just do this one. Heading. Okay. And ignition. Uh, we probably don't need that much pitch. This has pretty good thrust weight ratio. We got the little mount thing there. I've made a custom mount for the carrier plane as well, but that's meant to fit the Star Stage 2, not this. I might make a version of this stage in Blender that would be matching the shape so that it can use that mount as well. 
that is, you know, 150 tons is pushing the limit as to what the Orion carrier plane is meant to carry. But it looks like we could carry a little bit more. I wasn't expecting to get to the speed that we got to. I was expecting more like 3,800 meters per second. It's gonna be tight either way. We have to get to that high orbit. Basically, like a GTO transfer almost. And we are starting the fuel cells. Well, one fuel cell will do. They're identical to the spatial fuel cells in here. We've got two of them. And also the service module tanks from the space shuttle. The whole point of the Taurus space plane is it's basically uh, using the space shuttle technology. So it is the space shuttle OMS engines, or essentially was meant to be. And also the space shuttle's OMS tanks, they're, instead of being placed side to side, they're actually in line with each other. Uh, the helium, the MMH, and the uh, mixed oxides of nitrogen or NTO, whichever way. They're sort of in line here, and I made sure that they were the right size, so they're just sort of sitting in there. Actually, you can see the, the pill-shaped tanks sitting in there because I modeled them and put them in physically. So yeah, the Taurus space plane is supposed to basically be a tiny little space shuttle with a fully pressurized cargo hold, but smaller than the space shuttle, of course, by a lot, and use the space shuttle's tanks. And because it's smaller, using the same tanks as the space shuttle had for its own mess system means that it can basically do the same as Orion as far as Delta V is concerned. The, the NASA's Orion, not the Orion from 2001 The Space Odyssey, of course. So yeah, it can match NASA's Orion in terms of capabilities. The Taurus space plane has been flight tested. We slapped jet engines on and tested that it could fly. I forget if I've brought it through the through re-entry, but I, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes, but I think so. I believe we have done that as well. Okay, that will do for orbit, and we have 2,310 meters per second left in the stage, which was basically what I was looking for. Again, so we, uh, again we were trying for basically GTO level. I wanted 2,400, but this will do. And we are in a good orbit with minor inclination difference. So, question is when we should rendezvous with it. Well, it's basically taking all of our delta V. <laughs> so, uh, 1,440 there, and then another 873, and then there's a correction up there of 43.2. So, yeah, basically it's taking everything in this stage. So, we had just the right amount. Okay, well, I have a problem here. Tack life support is not doing its tack life support thing. I bet that's some dependency of tack life support that normally gets installed that Kerbalism didn't like, like background resources or something like that. Well, we probably can shut down two of the engines. It's gonna be too quick otherwise. Okay, well, here we go. We are carrying extra EVA propellant because them moving the stuff into the St. Louis or St. Louis is going to take EVA propellant. We probably put too much though. It's probably too much. Yeah, it was background resources repo soft tech that was missing. I think Kerbalism wanted me to get rid of it. Actually, before I do this, let me just restart the game with background resources active so that we do have the proper consumption. Okay, food, water, and oxygen consumption situation solved. They are being consumed now, and uh, attack life support is monitoring it. We have quite a lot because we are carrying all those supplies. Still not enough supplies for the Mars ship. We would have to do this more than once. We might want to expedite that somehow, but... Yeah, we have a 44.7 meter per second burn there and then 862 there to do. So we're going to need to use some of the Taurus's own fuel to finish things up. But we're still looking all right overall. The Taurus would then have to pull its periapsis down into the atmosphere and hopefully we would land somewhere safe. But it's a little bit difficult to figure out where the heck we're going to end up when it comes to returning. We'll see how that goes. 
Oh, we barely have any RCS fuel down there anymore. And that was the end of it. Okay, well, we will have to activate the Taurus' own RCS. Okay, time for the final rendezvous burn. Okay, oh, I didn't want to have that happen, but alright, we've got the decoupler there. Okay... And off that stage goes. <laughs> Not the ideal way to do that, but alright, we need the St. Louis once again targeted. 288 meters per second is all we have here right now. But because we underfueled this, of course. Nope, oh, there it is. We seem to be approaching from the right end. Um, we need to close in a little bit more first before doing anything else. And actually, we want to control from here now. It occurs to me belatedly that we might have a problem. The tails. <laughs> um, I don't know if it can dock on that thing. With the... It, we, we were supposed to have modules that sort of... Had a cone shape on the front. That doesn't. That's sort of flat. The space ab. We might need an extension of space ab to make this work. We can probably EVA the supplies in, but I don't know if this can dock to it directly. Yeah, that doesn't look likely to work, does it? I don't know if the HAB has enough space for all that food, water, and oxygen. This is an in interesting thing about uh, actually having the physical items. We may need a sort of supply container in front of it. In that case, we probably need more fuel modules as well. Can't really see it. Uh, it's actually closer than I thought it would be. Oh, we docked to it. Okay, so uh, we did have enough clearance. Just barely. There's just barely enough curvature there and enough uh, thickness to the docking ports that we could manage it. All right, open hatch. And this guy, open airlock. Oh, uh, actually not the airlock, sorry. That's a different hatch. Close airlock. We want the internal hatch. Deploy hatch. There we go. All right. Well, it's still going to be complicated. Okay, we are going to let Bill handle the moving of the supplies. Leave seat. Okay, well, let's get a drill and equip said drill, and on we go. Oh, the EVA propellant tanks are sort of getting in the way. This KIS container is also sort of not placed well. Bill's head. <laughs> Bill's head is... Okay, hold on. Okay, we are through. Let's just go back to front. We used a lot of EVA propellant, though. Okay, grabbing care package. Um, I don't think they can carry more than one, can they? Oh yeah, we can carry more than one care package at a time with the... I gave them a 2,000 liter capacity. Okay, we can do four at a time. That's good. Now, where do we put these? Um, I'm gonna put these on top of the wood panel airlock. Or actually on the bottom, I guess. It depends on your orientation. This is the floor of the hab when if it ever spins up to generate artificial gravity so it's complicated 
Who? They are bulky. And I still haven't fixed that Z fighting, darn it. Okay. Right. Back over. Let's maybe get some water this time. That's heavier. It might be harder for Bill to carry so much. But we've already used a third of our EVA propellant, so that's not great. Or uh, this oxygen these oxygen tanks are right here. It's sort of clipping into the ceiling, but we're gonna declare that to be all right. Okay, well, it's those two. All right, now let's get some water. Uh, we can only do one water tank at a time. But as far as having enough room for supplies for four Kerbals for a trip to Mars, I think we might need more space in here. I mean, assuming we want them to have space to do anything else except for have supplies. We might have to move stuff around to make sure it's not too imbalanced, too. Though it's a big ship, hopefully these units aren't too much of a problem. The water is a big deal though. Water is heavy. I mean, uh, basically 800 kilograms per container. Got a lot of food packages left. We've only done a quarter of the food packages. Uh, uh, need four trips for the food packages, but let's get the water first. It's too bad I can't sort of declare the interior of this pressurized and let them remove their helmets or something. Now, of course, uh, th it's tough to get them to move about as actual astronauts would in zero g inside their habitat. Not clear to me how. I mean, of course, Kerbal doesn't have any easy way of doing that right now. But as long as Bill can get into any seat, I think we can transfer EVA propellant into him from the ship, so that's good. Alright, let's, let's go to one of the seats inside this hab and see if we can transfer the EVA propellant over. Bill, or we could use ship manifest to transfer the EV propellant into Bill. Okay, Bill's all topped off with that. Okay, leave seat and we continue our work. Honestly, this whole transfer of stuff into the habitat is going smoother than I expected. A little bit time consuming, but it has a novelty factor to it. Yeah, the RCS has to react whenever I do stuff. Unfortunately, this is only half the supplies we would need, even for, I think, two Kerbals. I'm not entirely sure. But, uh, yeah, for one Kerbal, that's, let's say, four years. Or two Kerbals, so that's two years. So it's, uh, well, that uh, we need two years and nine months. Three trips for two Kerbals with this amount of supplies. And you saw our Delta V, this is basically all we can carry. Um, and then six trips for four Kerbals. The alternative is just to send the supply container up, but in that case, the habitat has to carry that container the rest of the way. If we don't want to transfer the stuff manually. So yeah, what you're looking at as far as all the stuff we're transferring is basically what one Kerbal needs for two years. Oh, well, one person. We don't have to say Kerbal. It's actually what one person needs for two years. There is sort of an aquaponics thing going here. I have not coded that in 
to produce food that uh, we should. That would help things a little, a little bit. I don't know how much actual food production we can get with a small section of aquaponics like that. Not much. Okay, and then just two more of the care packages, and then a couple of water tanks and some oxygen tanks. Oh, the oxygen tank is actually poking out the top there. <laughs> uh, not really what I was intending, but yeah, at least the spout should be at the bottom, but oh well. We can rearrange things later. Well, you know, there's realism and then there's realism. We got some room over there. It's tough to arrange things in 3D, really. You can hang stuff all over the place. Don't really need to be carrying the parachute about, but this is 1.8.1, so I don't think we can remove it. I'll look into whether any of this is possible in 1.12. And 1.12 upgrade will take some doing, but there are aspects of this uh, that would be a lot easier if we were using the stock placement system and inventory system. Oh, that doesn't clip the outside or any. Oh, no, it does. Shoot. Okay. The hatch is actually poking through the aquaponics thing. That is because I put the aquaponics thing after I put the hatch. I put the aquaponics thing, it was a separate part in Unity, so I tossed it in after I made the original model of the habitat and the interior. Alright, just some oxygen tanks left. Maybe I should just grab these and put these down here. Maybe we'll get the EVA propellant tanks over too. Little corners tucked everywhere. Okay, anything poking out? Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Where were those care packages that were poking out anyway? Over here. <laughs> Uh, we'll have to figure out. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see if we can move those. I wonder if I can grab them from the bottom and move them. Uh, yeah, it looks like it. Uh, all right, let's move them like that. Okay. No more problem. So yeah, we can grab stacks like that. That's good. I should remember that. But that's just grab. We can't put that in the inventory because the inventory doesn't have enough space. Okay. That does it for the oxygen. I think I'll bring in the EVA propellant containers as well. We don't need to bring those back down. Okay. All right. All done, finally. That is it for our hands-on logistics exercise. Okay, then it's all closed up. And now, this is 121 tons. Guess that's not too bad. I'm, I'm going to go for 70 kilometers and see what happens. But I don't know whether that's safe or not. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll be more conservative. Let's go for 80. Or um, 75. We'll do some light arrow braking first and try to line up with somewhere we could land at instead of splashing down in the water, but who knows. Okay, we are in the atmosphere, and the effects are pretty mild right now. Hopefully we'll get some decent drag out of this. That's one of the benefits of having the wings, after all. A little bit early for that to be red. We're using a lot of pitch authority right now. 
Well, it's probably a good thing we didn't go any lower. Well, Jeb and Bill, if uh, if Kerbalism had anything to say about it, they would get some decent amount of radiation. We've brought it down a little bit, but they're going to have a few passes through the radiation belts and everything. Not ideal. Okay, getting set up for pass number two. Well, obviously didn't get as much heating this time, and we're going back up. We're going to have to risk going substantially lower next time because we can't keep doing this. Uh, we just don't have the RCS propellant, among other things. Seems like the balance is a little bit off. We're nose heavy. So that's going to be a problem. Okay, well, we're getting some heat effects. Well, without NASA-like planning, I'm not entirely sure I can definitively decide where I'm going to land. But there's a chance that Australia will happen to be here at our periapsis side on the next pass. So maybe we'll take a chance at that. Unfortunately, Cape Canaveral is going to be on our apoapsis side. So unless we just make a regular orbit, lift our periapsis up and wait, it's going to be a while. Australia is probably the best bet. There's the communication lines to the Australia locations. Well, some here too. So Australia is over here, and our orbit is a two-hour orbit. So in about two hours, we could expect Australia to swing by over to this side. Maybe that's the best idea. 147 meters per second is not a whole lot left to work with as far as continuing to come into the atmosphere. It's a bit of a risk though. It's, this one's been a bit of a risk for Jim and Bill. Okay, well, we'll take 48 kilometers and see if that does it. So basically, in longitude, Australia is 114 to about 153. And you can see we're uh, coming into the atmosphere at 96. Okay, well, that's a lot of overheating, but that's on the AJ-10-190. <laughs> Stop that. That's not right. Okay, we are definitely coming down this time. But where? Oh, great, we're going up. <laughs> but, I mean, not for long, but... About 20 more degrees of longitude left if we want to land in Australia instead of the Pacific Ocean. And they're going by quickly. And we're going to overshoot Brisbane, I think. Yeah. Uh, actually, we're not that far south. We're probably over the Pacific already. The Coral Sea. Oh, well. I don't remember if this thing can splash down or not. Uh, waiting one more orbit to uh, let Australia slip more decisively into our landing path would have been a good idea. But here we are. Definitely over the Pacific. We are below Mach 3. Okay, we are below Mach 2 and switching to atmospheric autopilot. Cannot deploy while stowed. Yeah, I guess P, which is for atmospheric autopilot, also has something to do with the parachutes. Well, let's do a more shuttly pitch down 20 degrees sort of thing. We're still losing speed like this right now. Okay, well, here comes the water at about 90 meters per second. Ooh, oh, 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 we're flipping. Ooh, okay. Um, looks weird in the dark here, but uh, I guess we'll call this a mode to splash down. <laughs> uh, where's those inflatables that will write us? I don't know. Yeah, we have uh, ended up upside down somehow. Terrible buoyancy for you. All right, it's splashing down at 20 tons, by the way. Basically, 20 tons empty, this thing. All right, let's recover vessel. So, Jeb and Bill did survive after all. And this has been a test run of using the Taurus space plane as a method to resupply a Mars ship in high orbit. Um, We'll try other things in the following videos. We have to transfer some more supplies and probably I don't want to move all those containers inside the habitat. It's getting pretty crowded already, so we'll probably have a separate container up front. And then also we need to have 
the hydrogen topped off and some more xenon gas. So that is what's going to happen in the following episodes. With that, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.